All right. Good morning. Okay, everybody have a fun weekend? Have got a harvest? Yes. Any highlights? No? Did anybody see the strongman routine? The busker guy doing the strongman routine? Yeah, he was, he was pretty amazing. All right. So that is pretty much the high point of Fredericton's year out of the way. So we can settle back into this. So we're going to run or continue on this sort of vein for the next few lectures that we sort of started with talking about climate and talking about the environment and the big environmental drivers or variables which determine a consumer's ecology or the ecology that we see in a, in a region or in a system. And today we're going to talk about water in all its many and wonderful forms. And we're going to discuss, we know that water is essential for life, but why is that? What characteristics of water make it so important? We're going to talk a bit about the water cycle, how water is distributed across the earth, and how it moves around the earth. And then we're going to talk a bit about the, the actual physiochemical properties of water and the type of bonds that it forms and why they have a why that particular trait of water is important and how it affects the, the, the organisms that live within water and the organisms that rely on water. We look at this in terms of how water, we talked a bit about this last week about how water transfers heat around the globe adaptation to of different organisms to life in an aquatic environment and then water sort of following on from that as a as a selective pressure then we talk two sort of final topics to talk a bit about life at light light yes light light attenuation of water so how light water <laughs> absorbs light what effect does that have on organisms which live close to the water surface or further deep, deeper down. And then a bit about thermal stratification, which is if anybody's jumped into a lake in the middle of summer and found that once you get it started the water and it's nice and warm, but your toes are freezing cold, that's thermal stratification and that's really important. And we'll talk a bit about more about why. So first of all, water makes up around about 60-70% of a human body. This changes over time in a newborn, newborn infant, it's closer to maybe 80%. Elderly person is probably closer to 50 or 60%. All our organs, the, the things that are, are, are essential for our life, are made up predominantly of, of water. It may be more accurate to say that they contain a lot of water. Has anybody done wet mass and dry mass work? Did you do any in any of the, the lab classes? So if you take a, a tissue, a piece, of, a piece of human tissue, or a piece of animal, or a piece of plant material, weigh it, it has a certain mass, we can then dry it until we've got all the water out, and it has a much lower mass. That's where the majority of that, when we say that 70 or 80% of, of, our, of our body consists constitutes of water, is made up of water. That's where a lot of that water is. So it's, it's the medium through which we exchange nutrients, so we absorb nutrients. It's the environment in which our cells exist and our cells, cells live. But so it's, it's essential to our, to our functioning as a, as a biological organism. It's really important on Earth. So this is Earth. Anybody who's read any of Carl Sagan's work will sort of know about Earth being a pale blue dot. If you view Earth from space, this is what it looks like. It doesn't look green, it doesn't look white, it doesn't look brown. It's mostly water. So 75% of the Earth's surface is covered by water. So it's a habitat for a vast array of organisms. And as, a, as an ecologist, we need to understand it. We need to understand this habitat. We want to understand its importance. It makes 
it has a very unusual and a very specific chemical makeup. So water, the should certainly know, is made up of two hydrogen atoms and bonded with one oxygen, H2O. And these can form, or they do form, quite strong HO bonds between different molecules of, of water. And this leads to, as we're going to see, a lot of very interesting characteristics. One, they can bond with each other very well, but they can also bond with a variety of other things. So this leads to water, I'd like to say it has a particularly unexpected <coughs> trait that water is sticky. We don't think of water being sticky, but if you put it in an environment like this, so there's no gravity, nothing to pull it apart, those bonds are holding each other together. So that's H2O bonds, H and oxygen, those hydrogen and oxygen bonds are holding those molecules together. It also, we'll talk a bit more about this later on, because it forms bonds with a lot of other elements, a lot of other molecules, it, it can absorb them, it can dissolve them out of, the, out of the soil, that's what's happening. And those essential atoms and elements are being incorporated into the water and drawn up into plants. And that's because of the, the chemical properties of the bond. That's at the, at the root of what's happening, at the root of why plants have a root system that can absorb water, why it's important for them to be able to absorb water. The vastness, so we said that the earth is, almost 70% of the earth's surface is covered with water. The vast, vast majority of that, over 97%, is held within the oceans. <coughs> Smaller proportions, we've got some ice, it's mostly around the, the ice caps. Less than 0.5%, 0.5% is all other water on Earth, that's sort of not within the oceans. Of that, the majority of it is in, in lakes, some in the land, some in the atmosphere, and far fewer rivers than, than there are lakes in the world. It's vitally important, it creates a habitat, it creates an environment, it's dispersed across the, across the planet, but it's not stable, it's not, a, it's not static. The water that we can sort of see as water runs through rivers and down into lakes, that it's, it's constantly moving, but at, a, at an atomic level, in terms of that the molecules are also constantly being moved around in the environment. So we can take here, take an example where we've got some precipitation over a landscape, water droplets form, they can be intercepted by, by plants or trees or land on the on the surface, on the ground, on the ground surface, from which they sort of filter down into deep groundwater or potentially run off down into rivers and lakes then they can be immediately transported back into the atmosphere, either through evaporation, that we talked about in, in previous lectures, or transpiration through plants and trees, which are absorbing water, using all the nutrients that they're getting and the and elements that they get when they absorb the water, and then release the water back out through the leaves. We fail or we turn these two routes, so we've got evaporation and transpiration, you can call those evapotranspiration. And that's all the movement <coughs> of ground or surface water back into the atmosphere. This happens on a, we've sort of looked at that on a, on a local scale. If we can visualize the same thing happening on a much larger and a continental scale. The exact same processes are occurring, but we're moving water over a much bigger <coughs> area of land. This happens as well as, or in addition to, that more <coughs> local movement of water. And ultimately, we can blow this right out to, to a global scale, where water is, being, is evaporating over the oceans and moving over land, falling in, 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 through lakes and rivers, ending up back in the ocean, working its way through the land. The key take home is that this is not a steady, it's not a stable state. This water is constantly being in flux, constantly moving. 
and we term this uh, the global water cycle. Water occurs in a liquid form in bottles, also in solid form in ice or in a gaseous form. And because, again, we go back to the molecular properties or the chemical properties of water, it's a quite a, three days, so almost a unique compound in that the solid form, ice, is less dense than the liquid form. So ice flows above water. And it's due to, you can sort of see how it goes when it forms these bonds, it's <coughs> typical ice to bond in the solid, that that would sit above the liquid form. If it wasn't for this, this, this property, certainly somewhere like, like New Brunswick, the vast majority of the freshwater life we see, the freshwater family we see, could not exist. Because so if the water freezes from the bottom up, there's no habitat remains, there's no remaining habitat for aquatic organisms. Instead here, this is a plot from a picture of the pumpkin sea fish in the Great Lakes. And here, because the ice forms on the, on the lake surface, there's still habitat below. There's still a lot of oxygen remains in that, in that water, provided the water is clean. These organisms have access to sediment, which contains invertebrates and snails, and this bacteria, microorganisms are still active. The environment can be maintained. The environment remains below the ice. In certain conditions, in the right conditions, what we can even start to get because we get still some sunlight coming through, landing on this ice, and we can get an algal layer that builds up, and that film, like a bio, bio, biofilm, that builds up below the ice and creates a new habitat, a secondary habitat associated with the ice. So it's a, an unusual trait, but a key trait for it which allows life to exist and to, to maintain within a aquatic environment. I talked a little bit earlier about the, the, the bonds, the type of bonds that, that water forms. So this is typical water molecule, and this is typically at, a, at an atomic level, say, a molecular level. How water, how water bonds form. They form these like hydrogen bonds, so the hydrogens are, are linked to two separate atoms or two separate molecules. And this has some <clears throat> very particular and very important characteristics or very important consequences. First of all, this this chemical construction is the reason that, that on this type of bonds, these are very, very solid, very strong bonds, and it takes a lot of energy to, to break. And that's why water can hold a lot of heat energy in its, in its liquid form. We characterize this in two, sort of, two different terms, or two, two terms for different components of how a, any, any material responds to being heated and how it holds heat. First of all, the first of these is a specific heat, which is the amount of heat energy that needs to be applied to the material to increase its temperature by one degree C. It should be five, I'll change that. It should be five one degree instead of two one degree. And then second or additional to that is latent heat. And that's the amount of heat energy that's required to push a transition between different phases. So to push a solid to a liquid and a liquid to a gas. And for water as a, as a medium, <coughs> both of these traits are, are quite high. It has a high specific heat and a high latent heat. 
in relation to to other to other material. We can sort of visualize this on a, on a plot. And on the x-axis here, we have heat being added at a constant rate. And on the y-axis, we've got the, the temperature measured within the within the material. So we see we can start down here at minus 20, we start to heat it with heat. At around at zero, we, we reach this transition phase. But you can see that it's not immediate. It takes, it takes continual adding of heat to force it over that transition. Again, and then we've got a full range of 100 degrees that water remains in a solid, in a liquid form. All the way from zero to 100 degrees, we can continually add heat energy, but water will remain in a liquid form. So that's quite an unusual trait. And again, then when we get to this high latent heat, or this latent heat transition from a water to a, sorry, from a liquid to a gas, it requires a lot of energy to force that transition through. You can think of this as you boil a, a pot of water. It takes, it takes a while for it to get up to heat, and then slowly you start to see the water boiling. The small, some small bubbles start to appear. And some parts of that water are being converted into gas. But it takes quite a while to get it from, from that point, even with a steady addition of heat, through to the Full, the full liquid being turned into a gas. That's what we're seeing there when we look at a, a pot of boiling water, boiling pasta, for 15 minutes. We're looking at has that effect. It can hold that extra heat for that extra amount of time, which in, in that situation makes it a good substrate for a good material for, for cooking with because it can hold heat. It can keep heat around our food for a long period of time. <coughs> this is also responsible for one of the traits we talked about in the previous lecture on climate, where water can move, because <coughs> water has a, a conduit for moving heat around the globe. We can take somewhere here in the Gulf of Mexico, large bodies of water are being heated up they're being pushed and moved by the, by the ocean currents, but they remain warm. They don't lose that heat quickly. This trait here of a, a high specific heat works for both heating and cooling. It takes a long time for water to cool back down again. And that's what we see here. Even though the water is moving to higher latitudes and moving north, it, remain, it maintains its heat for a long period of time and transfers a big bubble of warmth right the way up the, the North Atlantic. We can also see this in some of the climate change data. There were some reports a while ago talked about this um, supposed pause in global warming. And subsequent data, some data from NASA that sort of came out showing that this was primarily related to it's taking a, a reduced heating rate in the oceans than on land. So if we look, this is sort of these temperature anomalies, these similar plots that we looked at last week, how they change over time, and we can see that the land temperature here in red is increasing much faster than the water temperature. The water temperature, however, is also increasing. It's just taking more energy. It needs more heat energy to increase the temperature of that water than it does to increase the temperature of the land. Oops. This is why, so this has all sorts of ecological ramifications. If we take here, it's why we can have warm adapted species living off the coast of Ireland because they're bringing, there's warm water that's being brought to them. It's bringing warm, it's changing their environment. It's why aquatic organisms can, it's one of the reasons, so let's take, let's take everybody's favorite, let's take mosquitoes. 
Okay? During the summer, mosquitoes come out, hit on us. It's for afraid of spread it's mad. Once they've met, met a partner and come, and lay, lay, come back, laid some eggs, they've moved into that aquatic environment. They can stay in that aquatic environment all the way through the winter because even though the air temperature has dropped right down to minus 20 or minus 30, the water temperature is stable, stable around about three or four degrees. Because water can make, keep its heat, it allows not, not just mosquitoes, also things that, things that we like to have around as well. It allows them to, to maintain themselves in a, an environment such as ours here in Canada. The bonds that water forms also create this high surface tension within, the, within water. So if we see sort of things like this, or if anybody spent time around a pond or a river, would be used to seeing these sort of different pond skaters or water skaters that can actually skate on that surface film. The, the surface tension is hard enough or is solid enough to create a film that can maintain, that can hold the weight of these small insects. That allows insects to use water as a, a route to, to get around, as a, a way to go and find prey. It also creates a new, a different niche, a different prey environment for predators. So we have different fishes that will feed primarily on surface insects. This trait of water and the type of bonds it's forming is, is changing the habitat, is allowing organisms to adapt to this environment. Kind of similar trait, water, we call it highly distant. Water, so we that water is, water is sticky, water is strong, water is thick. We don't think of water being thick, but for a, an organism, if you, and most people have had this experience of if you're in a swimming pool or in a lake, and you try to move or walk through the, through the water, you can feel that pressure against you. That's, the environment that aquatic organisms exist in. We get things like, like diving birds, which are able to, which have to move, be adapted to be able to transition, or are adapted to be able to transition between life in a, in a terrestrial environment or in an air environment, and also in a aquatic environment. And to be able to get at their prey, they need to have an extreme streamlined or ability to transition to an extremely streamlined body shape that allows them to almost dart through that water. You see the same thing in, in fishes, really in any organism that has adapted to an aquatic environment. So there's three plots. The first of these is a shark, the next is a marine mammal. And then the, the intermediate, or not intermediate, but the third is actually an ichthyosaur, a representation of a similar to a dinosaur from prehistoric times, developed from fossils. So these three different fields of life, these three completely different types of organisms that have ar arose through totally different, from totally different strands. We've got fish. Reptiles, mammals, have all adapted to the same body shape because they exist in the same environment. So evolution has brought them through a similar body shape because they're faced with the same trials. They're faced with the same challenges. They have the same selective pressure working on them. We term this as convergent evolution, when we see things coming from a, a different shape or a different source and ending up with a similar phenotype, with similar biological or ecological traits. Finally, because of the type of bonds that water forms, we see a high solubility of, of polar compounds within water. So where it form, it's very ready for, very easy for oxygen, for water to form bonds with itself, 
it's also very reactive and it's very easy for it to form bonds with, with other things. This is one way to sort of turn the universal problem because of the number of different things that water can dissolve and can absorb. And this is what this is essentially what's happened. You see a salt crystal here, it's put into a medium of water, and the water is forming bonds, it's cleaving apart the, the NA and CL, and forming bonds with each of those independently. And this leads to Two, two, two sort of traits associated with this. The first is that it can dissolve large amounts of material. So anybody who's visited some of these sort of limestone rich areas or seen these limestone caves, or seen sort of documentaries about these, these limestone areas, that you can have whole chunks of, of rock, whole sections of, of earth, that have just been dissolved by water slowly, slowly over time, creating these massive cave complexes. But what happens to those materials? As they get dissolved, they get broken down or they get absorbed into the water. We know that the water isn't static, it's constantly moving, so it may move out into the groundwater, out into a river or a lake, from there it can be rise through evaporation, move to even to a different continent, land on the ground, land, land back on the earth, be absorbed by, by plants through the roots. And as it's being absorbed, it's bringing with it all those essential or all those nice elements and atoms that it's picked up from the soil, or picked up previously in the soil, and they're absorbed with the water up into the plants. And essentially, then it can be can even by as they're consumed by, by herbivores or by animals, integrated into other consumers' tissue. It's this cyclical nature of water associated with the, and in addition to its chemical composition and the way it works, that allows that process to occur. It's also why water is such a valuable resource for plants. And one of the reasons why water is such a valuable resource for plants. And we see plants here with different types of different types of plants have different types of root systems. It can be a diffuse root system or a tap root system that will allow them to get up water within a plant community. They're constantly competing with each other for precious for valuable resources for resources which may be limiting. Finally, it's why the sea is salty. So by absorbing all, by containing all these different ions and elements and atoms, as these get reserved or brought into the sea, water evaporates away from them. Some are brought away in the, in the water, depending on the, depending on the temperature. A lot of the water that evaporates off is just pure CO2, or sorry, pure H2O. So we get an abundance of these ions, these dissolved ions within the sea, within the oceans. And that leads to, so that's one of the reasons that we have salt water in the sea. And all the traits that are associated with that from a, from, from a marine environment, that marine life is adapted to, it takes advantage of, and uses. Okay. That's all I'm going to say for now anyway about that, the molecular bonds or the importance of the molecular bonds. I'm going to move on for the next 15 minutes or so. We talk about these two other traits or characteristics of water. First of all, that, that water absorbs light. This is a plot take, sort of taken from your textbook. So, so percentage of light at the, at, the, at the surface, and how much of that light is remaining as we go down through the depth. We've got a hypothetical scale here, sort of 1 to 100, we call those meters. Within the first 
10 meters, we've lost around about 40% of the light. Within the first 20 meters, we're down to less than, well, less than 40%. Once we've reached 100 meters depth, there's practically no visible light has remaining. And this is, this is the properties if it was to move through pure H2O. If you were just to have a, a, a tank of pure water, no organic material in it, no fish, no plants, no phytoplankton, no sediment, that you'd still see that the light would be absorbed. And it's not even. Any, any divers? No? Okay, so anybody who's done uh, scuba diving will know that as you go down sort of in that from 5 meters, 10 meters, 15, 20 meters, the, the color of things changes because very quickly you lose, this light disappears at different points in the spectrum. So you lose the red light first, followed by the yellow, and finally the green. So as you go deeper into the water, you lose there's less red light visible. This trait or this characteristic is particularly important because it determines the photic zone. It determines the depth at which organisms, which are photosynthetic organisms, which require a full range of a broader range of, of sunlight, can continue to photosynthesize. If you so, if you were being on a, a in a marine environment, what colour are marine algae? What colour are seaweed? Brown, yeah. In terrestrial environments, where we've got a full range of the of spectrum, it's beneficial. Or plants, they the particular pigments that maximise photosynthesis. Photosynthesis of plants are green. So they can absorb, having got green pigments, allows them to absorb more light. In a marine environment or an aquatic environment, it's brown because we've got a different spectrum of light that's available. So because of these traits, there's differences in organisms have, have adapted to it. What it means is we want to have a rich photosynthetic zone where we've got a lot of phytoplankton. That's really restricted to the upper five to ten meters in a, in a marine environment. It can be even higher, or it can be even sorry, it can be lower. It could be the upper one or two meters, depending on how much nutrients there are in the, soil, or in the water how much sediment there is in the water, how, many, how much particular organic matter there is in the water. Here, so sun hits, uh, hits the ocean surface, or the water surface, stimulates the growth of, of, of phytoplankton. These phytoplankton are a prey source for, for zooplankton, which in turn are a prey source for fish. All of this typical, or this sort of surface food web, is driven by photosynthesis probably within the first meter. Yeah. Once you go below that photic zone, there isn't enough light. The light that's coming through isn't powerful enough to stimulate photosynthesis. So there's no further photosynthetic growth once we move below that photic zone. That means that the organisms which are which are further down, which are deeper, or at least the vented food web, say, is primarily fueled by pelagic detritus, by things that are sort of drifting and raining down in this pelagic zone. Dead zooplankton, dead fish, dead phytoplankton. Consumers are adapted to, benthic consumers are adapted to feeding on those because there's no, or there's very little production in the, at the at the depth, this occurs <clears throat> re realistically within two to three meters. So the whole the, the, the life of the oceans is primarily driven 
find photosynthesis occurring in that two to three meter band. One, one or two are starting to see some more, as it, to get more information, we're starting to see some more diversity in production, production duty pattern. And one of the big changes and one of the big discoveries that's probably occurred within my lifetime is uh, for initially the discovery of and then discovery of the importance of is um, oceanic vent, where hot, hot plumes of nutrient rich water are being forced up out of the out of the Earth's crust. And associated with those are a lot of sulfur oxidizing bacteria. And these are organisms which are able to develop, develop matter from the nutrients that are being released from these oceanic plumes. And they are the, the basis for an entire benthic community or a community of benthic consumers. And this is one of the rare instances of production, even on the planet, that is not driven <coughs> by sunlight. So this is primary production, fueling a food web, and no sunlight is involved. There's no, they're not feeding either, there's not all the citizens, obviously, with the, the depths of the ocean, and they're not feeding on pelagic <coughs> soil. It's an entirely different source of food or source of nutrients. <coughs> the last thing I want to talk about is stratification. Is this trend of stratification and why it's, why one, why we see it, and two, why it's really important ecologically, particularly from a, from, for things living in an aquatic environment. So I started at this, mentioned at the start of the lecture, this idea or the sense that a lot of us have had when you jump into a pond or jump into a lake and initially you feel nice and warm but you go through a very rapid area of temperature decrease into a much cooler area. We call these the, the epilimnium where we've got warm water, low density water and the hypolimnium which is cold, high density, deeper water. And there's a zone of very rapid temperature change between those which is a thermocline. And this is characteristic of, of lakes, any large lakes, sheltered lakes, particularly in, in this region, around, around sort of temperate region. And the reason this occurs gets back to what we talked a bit about when we talked about ice. That water is at its, so here we've got a plant of water temperature, against the density of the water. So here water is at its least dense at zero degrees when it's ice. That's why ice floats above water. That's why zero water at zero degrees, which is ice, floats above water, which is four, five, six, seven, eight degrees. We know we go through this very rapid shift, this sort of phase shift between ice and liquid water, anything just above zero. Here, water is at its, at its densest. Well, in fact, it's at its densest around about four degrees. So any water that is warmer or cooler than four degrees is less dense than water that's around about four degrees. So what's happening? In a, um, in a lake, <coughs> open water, sunlight is shining down, it's heating the water, it's warming up that surface layer of water. And that, as that, water, that surface layer of water is getting warmer and warmer, it's getting less and less dense. So it's essentially it's floating above this layer of cooler water. And if you've got a situation where that water is not getting mixed because you're in a relatively smallish lake or you're in a, a summer period where there's low, or uh, the, the amount of wind is low, or you're in an area that's well shaded by trees or uh, 
protected by food. There's very little opportunity for mixing, there's very little opportunity for winds to come through and turn that water over. And that surface layer of water just gets warmer and warmer and warmer, and the water below it doesn't get a chance to warm because it constantly stays below it. It's constantly denser. So that gives us a result in, in a situation where the top layer is, is lovely and warm, the cooler layer, the lower layer, deeper layer is very cool, and there's a very sharp transition period between the two. And this is really important for, for lake dynamics. Because in that surface layer, that's where all the photosynthesis is occurring. That's where all the production is going on. And all those algae are using up new, the nutrients that are in the water. They're using up all the nutrients in that surface layer and all the oxygen in that surface layer of water. And some of that detritus, dead algae, dead plankton, things like that, is filtering back down to the lake bed. And we end up in a condition or in a situation where on the surface, we've got warm, nutrient-poor water. And below, we've got cool, nutrient-rich water. In the middle of summer. Epilimium, thermocline, hypolimium. Around about this time of year, as the temperatures start to break down, things start, days start to get cooler, nights are getting cooler, leaves are falling off trees, reducing the amount of barrier, wind barrier. We start to move into a big period of turnover. So that's, that structure within the lake is breaking down. That thermocline between warm and cool starts to break down. We get a big swell and a mixing of water within the lake. And one of the things that does is it can bring all those nu that nutrient-rich water back up to the surface and bring some of that warmer water back down to the lake bed. Increases the overall temperature of the lake a little bit, but brings those nutrients up to the surface, which can stimulate, even still, even now, we still have the weekends like this, where it's unseasonably warm, very sunny. That nutrient-rich water comes to the lake surface, we get a big boom, <coughs> a big pulse of phytoplankton, late season phytoplankton boom, which can create a nice resource for zooplankton to fuel things on into the winter. As we move into the winter, ice comes in, ice covers over the lake, insulates the lake from, from the power of the wind. We still, we're working off a, a slightly different situation, but we've got a stratification occurring again within the lake because there's no opportunity for mixing. The water at the surface will stay a little bit warmer than the water down below. And the lake will sort of stabilize. In the spring, as the ice melts, we get a big pulse of that cold, certainly here, where we've got a lot of snow. I used to live and work up in Lapland. We have lakes there that had a meter of ice, about another meter or so of snow above it. In certain conditions, all that could melt within about two, two weeks. We've got a big pulse of that cold water coming down into the system. At the same time, the ice is breaking up. The lake is getting turned over and shoots around and moved. We've got more sunlight because the days are opening up. The days are becoming warmer. That stimulates, again, another big pulse of phytoplankton bloom, big phytoplankton bloom, right at the start of the season. And that quite often, this is a plot from, from Lake Ontario, from Lake Erie, sorry where we get these early season plankton booms because the, the stratification within the lake has broken down and it's a big pulse of productivity, a big starting pulse of productivity. Quick wrap up, so they, what, we've, so what, what have we talked about, what have we covered? So we talked, so water is essential for life. It moves through the, through, through the planet, and as it moves, it's bringing nutrients and things with it. This is because of the physiochemical properties, its traits. We also know, we talked a bit about how the absorbance spectrum of light 
in water determines the type of photosynthetic pathways, the type of productivity and production is seen in food webs. And then another thing about thermal stratification, which is really associated with nature. In the next couple of lectures, we're going to shift from water and talk a bit more about soils and sediments and why that's important to terrestrial biology.